Welcome to our forum discussion on the roots of prejudice. We'll be talking about what our prejudices are, where they came from, how they're nourished, and perhaps even how to get rid of them. Let me introduce you to the four student participants in today's discussion. Ratnati Iskandardi Nata, high school student, 17 years old, and also a talented dancer from Indonesia. From Japan, Yoriko Konishi, whose lovely voice you've just heard. From time to time, we like you to get a sense of what we do in all those times when we aren't having serious discussions. We very often get Yoriko to dance or sing for us. She does both. <coughs> from the United Kingdom, 18-year-old Judith Reeder. Judith's got a bit of a cold today. It did not come from swimming in the Atlantic Ocean, although she assures us that when she's in England, she does swim in the ocean during the winter. From the Philippines, Raul Contreras. Raul will be 16 years old, patriotically enough, on the 4th of July. Uh, he may admit some prejudices, but one he obviously doesn't have is a prejudice against women, or he wouldn't have been willing to appear tonight with three women being the only male on the program. Now, on this question of prejudice, perhaps we ought to start out by uh, trying to define what you think prejudices are. What do you think prejudice is, Ratnati? Well, I think prejudice is a feeling of hate of people as a group or individual to it, uh, other people. You say a feeling of hate. Do you think prejudice is as strong as hate? Yes. Uh, when we ask somebody if he has a prejudice, then the answer will be, I hate such and such. Well, I suppose that is true. What do you think prejudice is, Eureka? Well, I have found that, that uh, if somebody distinguish between two white men, it is not prejudice. But if somebody distinguish between a white man and a colored man, it is prejudice. I would define prejudice as uh, a rigid opinion formed about a certain thing uh, before there has been a just examination of the facts. When a person loses track of the uh, dignity of the human soul and begins to judge others not on the basis of their being persons, but on the basis of race, creed, economic status, that is prejudice. Well, is it fair to ask you whether you have any prejudices? Well, I guess so, Mrs. Waller. And uh, being brutally frank, I am, I'm, uh, well, prejudiced against Japanese. Well, not to the extent that, that uh, I hate them. No, not that way. But uh, I got this, well, as a result of World War II. Because, well, I guess I was yet too young to understand uh, what happened during those times. But uh, I think that what my relatives and friends and the people who were witness to that uh, unfaithful occasion, well, they just uh, more than justify the fact. And uh, I think uh, it's justified for me to feel the same way because, well, I know that my people suffered very much under that rule. You still as prejudiced against the Japanese as you were? Well, five years ago, that uh, prejudice of mine was, uh, well, slightly fading away. But when Japan uh, stubbornly refused to pay reparations to us, well, the prejudice began to brew again. But now I found out from close contact with Yuriko and other Japanese that Japan isn't ready to pay reparations yet. Because as Yuriko said, uh, some of them, and most of them, even have to suffer the, the cold in the uh, classrooms because they can't afford to heat the schools. Um, Yuriko, you've got any prejudices? Well... I don't have any prejudice for Philippines, but <laughs> many Japanese people hate Korea because um, the president of Korea made the line, his own line, on the public sea between Korea and Japan. And uh, if the Japanese fishermen uh, go over the line, the, they, were, they are caught by Korean people and they can't go, go home for a while. And we are trying to be a friend um, for Korea. Now that we've started, we better go on around the circle. Judith, you got any prejudices that oh, you admit? I, yes, I suppose I'd better admit, admit them, although I'm English. Uh, I have some very foolish prejudices, you'll probably laugh. For instance, uh, as soon as I meet a person with red hair, I always put myself on my guard because uh, I have a silly prejudice oh. that all red-headed people have terrible tempers, you know, that they're as passionate as the color of their hair. Oh, and then I have another silly prejudice, uh, for example, when I first met the Australian delegate, Elizabeth Woodgate, who hasn't been on tele television, um, I was shocked by her accent, because to me it sounds just like a Cockney accent would in England. And uh, I, 
hope I'm not conceited or anything, but a, a, a Cockney accent in England, you know, most English people would shudder a little bit when they hear it. But she very frankly told me that she shuddered when she heard my accent. So <laughs> I, I got paid back for that, too. Why did she say she did? Oh, I think she imagines that... Uh, she said she really had to forget my accent in order to like me, because uh, it, it was too formal. I gather most Americans think about that about the English as well. So. <laughs> Ratnari, it's your turn. Well, sometimes I find prejudice <coughs> against the Dutch people. When in, in school, when I learned the history, and learn how the Dutch people treated Indonesian. And I have some other prejudices of my own. That's, uh, I hate people who were proud and uh, who feel that he is the master of the, the other people and who thinks that he knows everything than anybody else. Let's come back to you a minute, Ralph. Are there any prejudices in the Philippines between groups of people? Yes, uh, there are existing uh, prejudices between groups of people. As a matter of fact, uh, most of us still, well, are prejudiced against uh, a group of hybrids, those who have more Spanish blood than Filipino blood in them, and we term, term them as uh, mestizos. Well, it, uh, the, well these uh, incidents uh, well, usually occur in the schools. As you know, I'm in, in a school run by uh, Spanish monks, and... Uh, well, we have a lot of uh, we, we have a lot of those uh, of that group studying in our school, and usually they are they are favored. But uh, we think, and uh, well, we think that we are right in saying that they are sort of aristocratic, conceited, and high high headed and sore headed and all sorts of adjectives. And they have the uh, the foolish idea that they have uh, the royal blood or royalty in them. Well, how do you get along with these boys in school, Raoul? Are there any problems? Well, well, frankly speaking, I don't get along with them pretty well. As a matter of fact, well, we usually fight with it with one another. Oh, yeah. Is there any problem? Yes, Eureka. Yes, uh, Japan have had uh, many American or European soldiers after the war, and uh, most of them married with the Japanese girls, uh, not only formal wedding, and uh, they made children called uh, hybrid <coughs> and uh, I think uh, the hybrid um, have nothing to be punished but uh, some grown-ups uh, didn't treat uh, didn't used to treat uh, as the Japanese children and uh, grown-ups also used to treat the mothers of children um, oh. Japanese people thought that uh, the mothers of high are not good. They are horrible <laughs> because they married with foreign people, foreign boys. And uh, many Japanese people don't like to marry with uh, foreign people because uh, uh, they, have, uh, they live in different uh, customs and they consider with uh, different way. You still have a strong, may I say, prejudice in Japan against marrying people from other countries, don't you? Well, yes. Um, <laughs> Eureka, yeah. um, can, could you tell us something about the status of women in Japan? We hear the strangest things, and you've been telling me the strangest things. Could you um, tell us more well, about it? Before the war? Yes, and now. Or before well, up to about 60 years ago, Japanese people thought that the white, uh, white people are horrible because they are almost red hairs and uh, everything is so big in, about the bodies. And <laughs> quite a few people still think so. And in Japan, we think that something uh, to be beautiful must be small and delicate. You could hardly apply the word delicate to some of the big soldiers we sent to Japan, could you? But I never knew that you looked down on us because we were big. That's a very interesting. We always can, we are always proud of uh, if if we Western men are tall and handsome. We consider oh, that yeah. a, yes. Yeah, we are proud we are <laughs> to be small and delicate. What you said about skin color, uh, Eureka. I've heard that the. Uh, Chinese speak about us as pink people instead of white people. It's so much more difficult to be proud of being a pink person, isn't it? Oh, yes. You're a pink person. <laughs> <laughs> Might as well face it, Judith. Here we are. 
I feel scarlet. <laughs> uh, Ratnari, let's oh, get... I yes? Said, uh, Judith, <coughs> Judith, since um, Flickers has so many colonies and, um, well, let's say, all, nearly all, in all over the world, how do you feel towards the people in the, I mean, in the colonies? Uh, do you, you have some prejudice? No, I, I personally don't have any prejudice, at least I hope I don't, but I know that um, a lot of Europeans think of the Asians, for example, as, uh, as rather lazy. <laughs> I don't mean to be rude, but uh, that used to be the impression we had. You know, when we started our colonization, um, we thought we were doing good to you. I know that you, you dislike, for example, in Indonesia, you dislike the Dutch there, but they probably thought they were helping you. They were not helping us. See, you, you mentioned that we're lazy. We well, we are not uh, certain um, exactly lazy, but but they didn't get, uh, they didn't give us a chance, see? and the, we didn't get um, experiments to to build our country. Well, Judy, I don't think all Asians are lazy. No, please, you're misunderstanding me. I said that was a general opinion. Maybe not now. I hope certainly well, not. General opinion, but well, when it's not, it's uh, well, sort of wrong to to say that. Uh, they are lazy. Uh, let's just let's just say that they've got the very flat feet that they can't oh. lift them up. Because you've got to consider, for example, the climate in most of the regions in Asia. Well, it's just but natural. You you can't uh, you can't just uh, work with all the hot, the warm climate around you. Oh, of course, you'd always feel like fanning yourself, <laughs> or going to an air-conditioned theater or something else that where it's cold. Is there not only this difference of climate that explains? Uh, a difference in tempo, but is there a difference in philosophy too that perhaps we in the West haven't appreciated? I wonder. Well, as far as I know it, and uh, well, I think you've mentioned it in this program that Indians think that they should never soil their hands. And uh, in the Philippines, I must admit that, well, <laughs> we're sort of inclined to get white collar jobs and swivel chairs. Most of us do, especially the new college graduates. We don't want to work with our hands. We want to have, well, big bosses and uh, with pretty secretaries around us. That's the common tendency. Um, could you give a proof that we are lazy? Oh, gosh, now you put me in a corner. I was trying to give you an example. Um, you criticize the, the countries which do, you criticize the Dutch, for example. But um, I know the British, when they started doing their colonization, they tried to help the countries they were in. But. Uh, you think that we were butting in and taking away your opportunities? Well, yes, I think so. As a, I'll give an example about the Dutch that they, we, we didn't get a chance to be, to be educated, for example. That was when the Dutch were there? Yeah. Hmm. And um, do you think if you, if the people in the colony get a chance to get free, you will get them, do you think? Oh, now we're going right off the subject. Yeah. <laughs> See, um, my, my friend from Malaya is very glad that uh, Malaya will get the, the independence next year. Mm -hmm. She's very proud and she tells everybody that we, or she tells everybody that Malaya is going to be independent mm -hmm. uh, next year. Do you think that if you do that to, to the other uh, places, then you will um, yes, we we'll make them satisfied? Uh, well, we hope it will make them satisfied. Every country wants to be independent, that's only natural. But there comes a point somebody to decide whether they're ready to receive their independence. But I know we could go off on another long argument about that. <laughs> Maybe well, we can have what... I'm sorry, Ralph. Well, I was about to ask them, what do they think are the most uh, common or basic causes of uh, our prejudices? Is it uh, mainly skin color? Well, maybe. Do you mean the... Oh, do you mean, for example, taking the American well, people in the South? I guess taking the American side of it, it's just that the white people don't want to, to mix themselves up with the, with the colored ones. But what about the colored people? Perhaps they don't want to mix with the white people either. <laughs> well, what about, since you brought up the American race problem, uh, I'd like to ask you, uh, is it as bad as you thought it was going to be before you came, or is it better or worse? Well, I think uh, it's, it's uh, what I've seen here and what I've heard while I am here and uh, what I have read in the newspapers, it's just worse than I expected. Don't you agree, Judith? No, I don't agree. Um, in England, we don't hear too much about the American problem, except, of course, when a certain case came up and uh, the Supreme Court decision, we heard a lot about it then. But um, not too much. And when I came here, um, I had imagined from that, the Tiller case that uh, 
things would be really terrible in the South. And I found that there's a, a real feeling of optimism here. I stayed in a Negro family, and I was able to see the position, really a bird's eye view of it, you might say. And the first thing that impressed me was that the Negroes themselves um, were, were not happy about the situation, but were pleased. They were grateful for, for what progress had been made, and they, they were sure that uh, the, the situation would continue to improve. They Is said that the two weeks you were in New Jersey that yes, you stayed in the right, Negro family? Yes, I was in the Negro family. I know that was in the northern part, and conditions are uh, better there. And uh, I was very impressed with that. They said it would be a slow pr process, but things were gradually improving. It was a matter of breaking down tradition, and um, I, I was very happy to find that. I'd like to know some of your other experiences no. with... Yes, Eureka. Um, I've never seen any evidences evidence of uh, uh, racial prejudice in the United States, but mm. uh, I've found out that uh, most Negroes are laborers and they don't have a high position in on business. Mm. But uh, I was very glad when I, I saw the Negro girl in South Orange in Columbia High School uh, who was uh, the vice president of the student council. Mm. I'm glad you did too. Yes, right now. Yeah. Uh, here in, in New York and um, New Jersey, I don't see any uh, racial uh, segregation or something like that. But when when we stop in Williamsburg and we stop in Negro school, I saw it's very strictly. I mean, uh, the Negro school go to the special Negro, and uh, I was talking to some of the girls in the school, and I asked them how they feel about uh, being segregated, but they said that. Uh, they don't mind about that, and what they want is equal, equal rights. And there are some places that they can go, such as restaurant or some clubs. And I think that, uh, as uh, since all Americans claim and emphasize that America is uh, the most democratic country in the world, and as as far as long as um, segregation exists, I don't think it's a democratic. I mean, pure democracy. Well, uh, adding something to that, isn't it that, uh, well, in uh, the Pledge of Allegiance to the American flag, you mentioned something about, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation indivisible under God with liberty and justice for all. Well, the last phrase just doesn't sort everything. I mean, with this segregation problem here and the uh, discrimination against colored people, how, how in the world could you have uh, uh, liberty and justice for all? And uh, I, in one of my hospitality periods, I, I didn't expect that even the kids could carry it that far. I had the, well, uh, privilege, I should say, of attending one of the uh, dances sponsored by, by one of the uh, civic groups. And I just noticed that, well, it was a big dance floor, and all the white kids were assembled on the left side and the most, uh, well, shall we say, not strategic part of the ballroom, well, all the colored boys and girls were in there. And I never saw a white boy asking a, uh, a colored girl for a dance, nor did I see a colored boy asking a white girl for a dance. I had a nasty experience, too. Um, when I first arrived here, and I told, I happened to mention to a group of young people that I was going to stay with the Negro family, one of the boys got up and walked out of the room, and I felt awful. I thought, but well, we're in the north now, not in the south. And then when we did go into the south, I really came against it pretty hard. We went into this big store, and um, I was in the, the ladies' cloakroom, and I was washing my hands, and I was with a group of the eastern delegates, the rather darker-skinned ones like Ratnati. And uh, I was standing a little apart from them, and this lady came up <coughs> to me, and she pulled me to one side, obviously assuming that I was American, and she said, uh, she said, what are these Negroes doing in here? And I was so cross, and I, very, I told her as calmly as I could, that I was with them and who we were. And of course, her attitude immediately changed. But it gives you sort of a, a nasty shock when you come up, up against it face to face. You read about it in the newspapers. You hear about it, but you don't really realize the significance of it until it, it hits you in the face yourself. I think yeah. the major co uh, cause of uh, the prejudice is skin color. And uh, I think uh, the... I don't know why, but uh, I think uh, the white people think that uh, color people has, uh, have dirty skin and uh, they don't have progressive culture 
So, uh, so the white people are the most great, 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 and uh, wonderful person in the world. Thank you. So. On this matter of skin color, if you were here in the summer, you'd see lots of Americans on all the beaches trying to get brown. Yes, it's significant. I, I wonder what that really means. I think we white women have an inferiority complex. The Eastern women and the, the Negro women have a sort of reputation for being so beautiful. I guess we're a little just, jealous of them. I guess you just envy us colored people. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> well, is there anything corresponding to that? In well, I think so, Mrs. Waller, because in the Philippines, it's just funny. There's a common tendency among women, well, those who have a, 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 a dark complexion, I should say, or just a tanned one, or just a brown complexion, well, especially these uh, high society matrons, well, even if they've got already wrinkles on their face, they still want to bleach their skin. Suppose you meet one right now and you say, oh, good morning, and uh, you see that she is just tanned and brown. But after three months, you meet the same person, and with the hot with the useful society walk and uh, trying to be very dignified and uh, cultured and everything. And you just notice that her face was uh, lighter than before. And uh, when you look at, uh, at her hands and everything up to her arms, well, you, you'll be likable to, say, to exclaim, Holy Moses, because there's a, a real very great difference, you see. She's about very light here, but you look at, at the arms and everything and... Uh, the, the lower part of the body, but gee, it's, it's just a, a very great difference. It's colored here, but it's very light. Do they really bleach the their skins? They do, Mrs. Waller. They well, what pay. about Japan? Does that, Japanese women don't want to change well, it anyway, do some they? Some Japanese women, um, right, how does that? Dye? Dye? <clears throat> dye their hair red. Really? Yes. Uh, they like a red think. hair, but I don't like it. What about Indonesia? Well, as the Western people try to get the darkest, darkest skin, we try to get light, lighter skin, but we prevent uh, the sun, I mean, the... But you're such a nice color now, I oh. don't know. I think it, it's When so we go out, then we use a um, long sleeve blouse to, to prevent from the sun, so we don't get a very dark color skin. Uh, tell me, what are your governments, if anything, doing about problems of prejudice. You've each mentioned some prejudice that exists in your country. Uh, what are your governments doing to try to eradicate it? You mentioned the prejudice against hybrids. You mentioned the prejudice against hybrids, too. Uh, you haven't told us much about the position of women. Otherwise, by the way, let me ask you right here. Are women any freer in Japan now than they were before the war? Well, before the war, uh, there was no democratic. And uh, women belonged to men, and men controlled women and everything and uh, <laughs> men has first opportunity to everything even uh, getting out of the door women how to open the door first and men pass the first <laughs> and in the buses or theaters um, men t take seat first and if uh, there's no seat Women how to stand up. Oh, I, I'd love to live in Japan. Oh, <laughs> but they go back in America and but England now. <laughs> yes. Is it changing at all? Yes, quite changed. And uh, just now, women can bo vote, and uh, women have equal opportunity in everything. Uh, Judith, you were talking about your prejudice against Cockney accent a moment ago. Uh, is that still very strong in England, this prejudice of the so-called aristocracy against the Cockney? No, I don't think it's a very serious problem now, especially since the war. You know this idea that the English speak either with a Cockney accent or else with um, a very aristocratic accent? That isn't true anymore. Um, and we certainly don't despise people anymore if they speak with that. If you go into the House of Parliament now, you will often hear a North Country accent or a Welsh accent or even a Cockney accent. And we're proud of those kind of people because they are the people who, who got us through the last war and nobody would dare say anything against them. In fact, it's the aristo aristocratic accent which is the other side of the fence and people laugh at that nowadays, I'm afraid. In fact, you may think that my accent is a little cultured, but I assure you, back in England, I have not quite a Cockney accent, but still an accent. <laughs> at least you mean to say your schoolmistress would not totally approve of you? Oh, no, I should be corrected. I lot. hate to think what's going to happen when you go back after three months here. So do I. <laughs> You'll write me about that, won't yes, you? I certainly. wanted to have time to ask you what you thought individuals could do in terms of eradicating prejudice. But our time's almost up. Anybody got a quick answer? 
Well, I guess we should uh, carefully uh, examine the indiv individual first before passing any judgment on him. Mm -hmm. And if we ever pass a judgment, we should be just with it. That's a good note to end on. Thank you, Adati, Yuriko, Judith, and Raul. Next week, we're going to continue on this subject of prejudice with four delegates from Africa, one white and three colored. The delegates from the Union of South Africa, Gold Coast, Ethiopia, and Nigeria.